everybody. I feel like you're far away, but I'm not going to take it personally. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you could make it. Um, Lindsay, you're here. I mean, she told me last night she wouldn't be here, so. Oh, good. I'm so glad. Okay. Um, let's pray, and then we'll jump right in. Uh, Father, we're thankful um, that you never sleep or slumber or begin or end, but are always there and always aware and always watchful and gracious and good. I think thankful that you're um, here tonight with us, and I ask that we would be um, attentive to your presence and also um, ready to learn and um, have our eyes open to who you are um, by what you've done and what you've spoken to us in your word and um, through your people um, centuries and centuries ago. Thank you for the opportunity to gather and um, for this warm place to be and uh, just the chance to um, talk about um, you and, and how you've worked um, in history and in our, our own lives. Thankful for Jesus most of all. Amen. All right, so today we are still going to be doing some um, table setting, maybe is the right word for it, um, to get ourselves um, at a place where we can know what we're talking about for the next few weeks. I know there's a lot of prep and a lot of orienting to be done before we can can dive in, but I think the more we do that, the better we'll be equipped to understand things that come later. So tonight we're going to jump into sort of church history per se. I know we didn't really do much of that last week, but that's what we're going to do tonight. But we're still going to be kind of in our Bibles. We're going to talk about the first years of the church, the birth of the church at Pentecost, and then what's called the apostolic era, which sounds like a big fancy word, but it just means the era that the apostles were still around. Um, the part of, of church history where they were still presiding over the church as first the disciples of Jesus and then the apostles. And, um, and still a little bit talking about Rome and the context of, and all of that. So um, before we start, I'm just going to recap a little bit to remind ourselves of what we talked about last week. Um, so bear with me if you have a really good memory and haven't forgotten anything. Um, but it'll be good for me, too, just to kind of get get rolling. So, last week, we saw that the, the birth of Christ and the subsequent founding of the church did not happen spontaneously, but they were planned for events that God was preparing for, for centuries. His people for them, um, but also uh, the world for them. Uh, the Bible talks about this um, as the birth of Jesus as happening at the right time or in the fullness of time. So that's what I tried to show last week. The story of the church takes place within this big drama or what we could call the meta narrative of history. Meta just means like over, above, beyond. Um, narrative is just a story, right? So the the church exists in this broad, big story. Sometimes Christians talk about creation, uh, the fall, redemption, and restoration. Well, the church, uh, the story of the church takes place in that redemption window. So that's what we looked at last week. Um, and that redemption history begins way before the church itself uh, is born. God patiently and carefully reveals his plan, gets the earth ready, um, and prepares the way for Jesus to come for his own people, but then for the sake of all nations. Um, we also talked a lot about how serious sin is, how deep the effects of it go, how the solution for that problem we slowly see as scripture and revelation unfold needed to be a certain person needed to be a certain offspring able to fulfill the promises. Um, God chose to work through a family to bring about that offspring through a nation. That nation rises and falls, um, even under blessing and, and faith, the faithfulness of God, the provision um, that he gave to them. And all of this is just painting a picture, readying um, the way, making, the, making way for Jesus, the birth of Christ. 
God readily uses, we especially saw this during the intertestamental period, that time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, that God readily uses his people, but also anybody he wants to bring about his purposes, right? So the Bible specifically says that God uh, raised up Nebuchadnezzar, his servant. And that's weird language to use to talk about a really bad emperor from a foreign country, right? But in God's eyes, Nebuchadnezzar was his servant, and he used him for his purposes. And we saw that with the Greeks and the Romans, the Greek language, all those things. So that's kind of what we covered last week. Jesus was born into a world um, seemingly overtaken by these foreign cultures, Greek culture, the Roman Empire, but these were tools in God's hand to bring about his plan. Um, we, we looked at the growth of the church. Um, oh, this is going to be all animated again. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, and how it just explodes onto the scene. Even in the first 100 years, we, we get 10 times growth. Uh, and one word to describe this movement is a revolution. The, the movement of Christianity is revolutionary in the Roman world. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about that. And in order to do that, we need to think for a second about um, myths. So this is a history class, right, sort of. We, it, it might seem strange to you to talk about myths, so let's, let's kind of get a definition um, in mind before we jump in. So the book of Acts presents us with a history of, of the apostolic era, the time of the apostles, and the birth of the church and all that. And we could, I could have chosen tonight to just kind of go through the book of Acts chronologically. We could talk about how at the beginning it's sort of the story of Peter, um, how the birth of the church among the Jews in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. You get into the second half of Acts and it turns into a story about Paul and he brings the church to the Gentiles. I could have done that and I, and I consider doing that. Um, but I think there's a lot of tools available to you to do that, and you can read Acts on your own and, and know the story. Um, so I'm kind of choosing to look instead at the larger, the big picture, and what really is going on in behind the scenes in the book of Acts to understand why it unfolds the way that it does. Um, and I want us to think, for the second half of tonight, we're also going to think about it a little bit more topically. So we'll do that later. Right now we're going to talk about the behind the scenes more. Okay, so in the first couple pages of Acts, we start to see um, the church beginning to form. Jesus has ascended into heaven. Um, the disciples are getting together. We start to think of sort of, or we start to picture, if you think about the, books of, the book of Acts, my guess is you start to picture this sort of organic growth of this movement. It happens quickly. It's sort of um, idyllic. We'll talk about that. We'll see that in a minute specifically. Um, there's a lot of activity, right? And it just sort of seems like this spontaneous, revolutionary sort of sort of thing. So I want us to kind of have better um, categories for why that is. Um, the birth of Christianity and the church is really and truly, like I said, revolutionary because it actually is subverting the world around it. It's a subversive movement. Um, and there's a reason for that. So back to myths. I'm sorry, I'm feeling a little um, disorganized, but we're going to talk about myths. So let's give ourselves a definition. Um, a de the technical definition of myth, this is from Encyclopedia Britannica, is a symbolic narrative that ostensibly relates actual events and that is especially associated with religious belief. That's a lot of language. Um, Ultimately, what I want us to know is that myths are stories that shape us. They help us to understand the world. They help us to understand um, physical realities. They help us to understand spiritual realities. And that's why they're associated with religious belief. There are American myths that shape us and, has, and cause us to think a certain way about our country. There are... Um, historical myths that, that shaped cultures that went before us. 
Um, for a second, I'm going to kind of flesh this out. We're going to think about a Jewish myth. One Jewish myth we've talked a lot about lately is the Exodus, right? Last week we discussed how this becomes sort of an archetype for redemption. Well, there's another Jewish myth that I want us to consider. Um, for this section, I'm borrowing a little bit from a lecture that I listened to on YouTube that somebody sent to me um, about ancient philosophy. So the guy was Dr. Sugru. It was from like the 80s. Very grainy and weird sound, but it was actually very helpful. So I'm borrowing a little bit from him. Um, so this is Job. This is a painting of Job by Antonio de Pereira. Um, this is going to be on your table. We're going to fill that table out on the uh, handout. So Job is a Hebrew myth. And when I use the word myth, I don't mean a fictional story. It doesn't have to be a fictional story. Sometimes it is. In this case, I believe that Job was, Job was probably a historical figure. Um, but he's the hero of the story. We may not think of him as a hero, but he is. He's presented to us um, as, a, as a, an honorable person, particularly in comparison to the other people in the story, his friends, his wife, etc. His identity in the story is that of a servant of God, right? Satan, when he approaches God at the beginning of the story, says, have you considered your servant, Job? That's the identity that we're supposed to see Job through. His qualities throughout the story um, include primarily submission and surrender to God. The words that he uses are things like, shall I accept good from the Lord and not trouble? Right? He has this uh, posture of receiving toward God. He, um, naked I came, for, or naked I was born and naked I will return, whatever he says. Um, blessed be the name of the Lord, right? Like he, he refuses to blaspheme. He refuses to curse God. He has questions. He asks a lot of questions. But overall, his posture toward God is he is the creator and I am his servant. And his objective is to be righteous. And he actually thinks he's righteous. And we're given no reason to think that he's not. So the good life or the goal of Job's life is, is to be righteous uh, before, before God. And his theology is seeing God as one, as transcendent, as all-powerful, as the creator. All right? So all of this to say, the Hebrew mind is shaped by this myth. Um, Hebrews... The Hebrew culture, I believe because of God's revelation and goodness to them as a people, is to see the world this way, to accept that God is authoritative and in control um, and, and sees them, right? Cares about them. This is very much in contrast to the Roman way of thinking. We're going to now talk about a, a Greek myth that carries into the Roman culture as well. We talked last week about Hellenization and how everyone was influenced by the Greeks. Their language took over. So they had a lot of myths. That's something they're very famous for. Um, this is a story that shaped their thinking. So I want us to compare and contrast this to the Hebrew way of thinking and understand um, how when Jesus was born, his birth was very subversive, contrary to the Roman way of, of doing life. So the Greek story is um, Prometheus. We're not going to get into the details of the story. Um, I'm not an expert in this area. He um, just, I, I assumed you kind of knew the story of Job. I'm not going to assume you know the story of Prometheus. But he's a titan, which means he's a former god, part of, uh, part of the gods before the Olympian gods, um, part of that pantheon, though. And the story about him is that he's watching Zeus create man. That's who's, sorry about all the bodies. Job. They're all naked. I don't know why. Um, Prometheus is watching Zeus create humans, and he feels sorry for humans because they're not given any of these powers that the other creatures in the world are given. They don't have the speed of, like, a tiger or a gazelle. They don't have the strength of a gorilla or... Um, 
a, like a, an ox or a buffalo. They don't have the size of an elephant. They can't breathe underwater. They can't fly like the birds. These poor, sad humans, they're so weak compared to the animals. So what Prometheus does is he outsmarts Zeus and steals the power of fire from Zeus and gives it to the humans. And he's projected in the story as a hero because he gave men the power of fire. Um, so you can start to see how this myth kind of explains in the Greek mind how the world works. Uh, the gods gave man, or specifically Prometheus, gives man the ability to conquer nature a little bit and have this, this power, this technology of fire. Zeus is angry, punishes Prometheus, and this leads into the story of like Pandora and stuff, but that doesn't really matter so much. What I want us to see is that his qualities are cunning, sneakiness. He defies the gods. He outsmarts the gods. He conquers or helps man conquer nature in a way that they couldn't before. The objective here is power. Um, the Greek gods personified nature, so this is sort of an element that comes out in a lot of their myths, that um, we explain away nature by using the gods who are actually a lot like us. They have bodies, they're fallible, they're weak, they're petty, they're immature, they fight with one another. So the story that the Greeks, and then consequently um, the Romans, start to believe is that the goal or the objective is actually to be like the gods, to take power for ourselves, to conquer nature, to go beyond the limits of the human existence. So I'm hoping that you're seeing how different these myths are. One submits to the one good, transcendent, all-powerful creator God. The other seeks to be like these fallible, um, competing, conquering, human-like gods and conquer nature. Very different postures, right? This is the story, one of the stories, that's shaping the Roman world. The gods are to be appeased so that we can gain their favor. They're not loving or trustworthy. They're actually kind of like we are. They're petty. They're spiteful. We don't want to anger them. A hero is one who outsmarts and conquers. Our goal as humans is to be like the gods, gain mastery over nature, dominance over others. We should pause for a second because this, this lie, this objective to be like the gods isn't new to the Romans or the Greeks. It's actually the same lie that Adam and Eve believed in the garden, that they could be like God. So the Romans aren't original here. Um, cultures have been believing that lie. They believed it at Babel. And I think individually we believe that on some level ourselves. We would never say that. But we want to call the shots in our lives. We want to master other people. We want to master our children. We want to control. Um, we want to go beyond our limitations, right? Those are all sort of micro versions of the Prometheus story. The Romans are so deeply shaped by this myth um, that they actually start to perceive of their own human leaders as acting it out in their lives. So Caesar wasn't just the emperor, he was a god. As soon as somebody became the emperor, he joined the pantheon, people would go to temple, worship them, pray, you know, uh, make offerings to them. They believed that Caesar was lord. Um, the the uh, accomplishments of their Caesars were actually um, posted all over the empire in this thing, in these uh, carvings. So this is one from like a temple that still you can still see. Um, temples and like imperial buildings would have these 
carvings in them. This one you can see is about Augustus. They're, the Latin word for these is, I don't know how to say this because I've only read it. <laughs> Do you have words like that? Res geste, maybe? I don't know. Um, it literally means things done. And it was just like, Caesar Augustus has done this. He's conquered these lands. He's conquered these tribes. He's killed these people. He's um, defeated this enemy. He's built these buildings. And this was a story to pass around to tell the citizens of Rome, look, he's doing it. He's outsmarting creation, or he's outsmarting the gods. He's conquering creation. He's ascending to uh, his deified existence. Jesus enters this world, right? And he lives out um, through his life a new myth or a new story. And this story subverts the whole Roman way of thinking. God himself becomes the servant of God. God himself lives a righteous life. Look up at your Hebrew myth column. God himself submits to the Father. God himself becomes vulnerable and poor and oppressed. God himself not, comes not to be served, but to serve. God himself dies. So the whole Roman way of thinking, the whole world view, Jesus comes and he does the, whole, the opposite. He just turns it on its head. Instead of a man becoming like the gods, like their leader, Caesar, Jesus comes, the son of God, and becomes a man. Totally flips it around. He becomes the offspring promised in Genesis 3. And this is a direct rebuke of Caesar and the Roman world. It's really a direct rebuke of the human way of conquering um, might makes right, seeking after power, seeking dominion. He conquers, but not land and people like the Caesars do. He conquers death like it was promised to Eve and the serpent and Adam that he would do, and he fulfills the promise. These are his accomplishments. These are the things that he's done. And early, probably even during the apostolic era, the church starts to list these accomplishments. And they don't have buildings and churches and temples to list them on, but they start speaking them to one another. They're things that you're familiar with. We believe in Christ Jesus, his only son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who under Pontius Pilate was crucified and buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. These are a list of the accomplishments of Jesus. And already, by the time the first century comes to a close, the church is speaking these things to one another and saying, this is what our leader has done. They're talking of his accomplishments. This is um, the old Roman creed. It's the earliest version we have of what eventually becomes the Apostles' Creed in, in later centuries. So the, model, the motto of the church becomes, instead of Caesar is Lord, and look at what he has done, Jesus is Lord. And if you're living in the Roman Empire, the chances are you're not glorified like Caesar. Most people weren't, right? Most people were conquered by Caesar. They were living under a powerful, ever-present regime of 
like I mentioned before, might makes right, power, um, conquest, armies everywhere, the presence of their mil uh, military um, successes everywhere, right? So the people lived somewhat happily, like we talked about last week, in a peaceful place, but also ever aware of the fact that they were living under Caesar's reign. And a lot of those people are oppressed. A lot of the, them are slaves. A lot of them are women who are given very little rights, very little dignity. Children are given very little dignity. You know these stories of like Romans just leaving babies that were weak out to die, those sorts of things, right? So when a message comes in that Caesar isn't actually Lord, ultimately Jesus is, and the way to lead a happy life or to um, succeed or to have to live the right way, the goal of life is actually submission to a good God who cares so much that he sent his son to be like us. Well, no wonder this message was revolutionary and no wonder it spread like wildfire, especially among those oppressed peoples. And we'll talk more about that, um, who made up the early church next week. But the Bible talks about this. And if we have all this in our, in our minds, this background, um, it actually makes a lot more sense, uh, this passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians 1. I quit, my fingers are cold, so I can't turn the pages. Seventeen to thirty-one. I don't think I. I don't know if it's all up there, but. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent, eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of his age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? That's the subversion. He's taking the way the world thinks and saying, no, it's not that way at all. He's subverting it. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, who thought they were wise, the Greeks and the Romans. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and wonders and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling, blocks to a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And it goes on. There's an actual idea that Jesus comes to reject. And yes, it's the idea of the Romans, but it's also the natural way of, of man. So moving into gospel proclamation and the way that the church spreads, we need to remember that the gospel message isn't just a set of propositions. Sometimes we reduce it to like, believe in Jesus, he died for your sins, repent and believe, and that's the gospel. Well, that's kind of part of it. But the way that the gospel was functioning then was more like this. Look what he's done. It was a story. And it is a story for us today. Um, sometimes we reduce it to maybe like justification by faith alone. The gospel message is that you don't have to work for your salvation. Jesus did the work for you. Well, that's part of it. But it's, a, it's still a story. So let's look at how the, the Bible talks about the gospel. Galatians 4, 4, and 5. We read this last week. When the fullness of time had come, look for that things done, the list of accomplishments. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. That's the gospel message. That's the story. 
Romans 1, Paul, servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Pointing back to what we talked about last week. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gospel. This is what Jesus has done. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-5 For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. This is the gospel in Paul's mind. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised, and on, on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Real events that took place, real accomplishments by Jesus. This is the new story, the new myth that the church is to live into, to be shaped by. This revolutionary new myth is what compels the disciples and the other followers of Jesus after his ascension. And it's this community of people, of believers, who become the first church. Um, as he leaves this myth with him, because he lives it out with his life. A lot of times we talk about the work of Christ like it's the, just the cross and the resurrection. And we kind of focus on those two things. But Jesus' whole life was his work. Um, and that's what we see in him living righteously, uh, turning, teaching, right? Messing with people's way of thinking. All of that is Jesus' work. And as he's ready to end that, that life, right? He, his death and resurrection happens. He's about to leave the disciples. He doesn't leave them just on their own, but he actually gives them something to do. This revolution that this, he's lived out is now a message, and he gives, it, gives the disciples both a mission and a mode by which to accomplish that mission. Uh, in Matthew 28, this is a familiar passage of scripture. Um, these are his left final words to the disciples, right? Or at least final recorded words. He came to them and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the mission that he gives to the disciples. And he, again, is rebuking kind of the way the world is working. He's saying, all authority is mine. You think, you know, you're living in a world where Caesar thinks he has it. The um, Jewish authorities think they have it. And he's reminding them, it's not theirs. It's mine. And I came and I lived this life to show you that it's mine. And that is to give them courage in this mission that he gives them. We're going to talk more in the second half about what that mission really is in detail. But they're left with this sense that they are receiving, in some way, authority from Jesus to carry out the work that he started. So they've seen this revolutionary story unfold. And now Jesus is leaving them, which doesn't feel right. And now he's giving them authority to go out and do it. That's a big deal, right? Like, that's a weird way to end their time with Jesus. But we see from the book of Acts that they believe that authority is theirs, and they start to use it. Um, another um, crazy, weird event takes place. Um, and we're going to spend a few minutes talking about that. So this is their mission. They're, giving, they're given authority from Jesus. They know the message that they have is revolutionary. And then it gets a little weirder. The mode um, in which that they're going to carry out this mission becomes evident in this weird event that takes place. So this is sort of a long passage. If you have a Bible, you're welcome to turn to Acts 2. I didn't put it on the screen. All right. 
This event is called Pentecost. That's how we refer to it. And it is sort of the official birth of the church. Before I jump into what Pentecost is, I want to just clarify a, sort of a theological point real quick. Um, and we're not going to like talk about this in terms of what's right, what's wrong. I have thoughts, but I don't need to share them. Um, some people, when they talk about the church, they think of it as a continuation of Israel. So you might read books sometimes that refer back to Israel as the church, specifically calling Israel the church. Um, some people talk about the people of God as one continuous community. Um, so that's one kind of way of seeing it over here. Another way of seeing it is to see the church and Israel as two very distinct and separate entities. Different promises, different identities, different people, different um, fulfillments for them. It doesn't matter so much that there's those two different interpretations. We're not going to get into that, but I just wanted to like, some of you are probably familiar with that, and, and you might be confused by some of my language or um, trying to read between the lines. There's nothing between the lines. I'm just going to talk about it. Either way, Acts 2 represents a new, fresh reality. So if you think of this as the church as a brand new thing, then this is the birth of something brand new. If you think of the church as continuous with the nation of Israel, Acts is still the, the start of a fresh reality for the people of God. Okay, So either way, it doesn't really matter the theological. Some of you are like, I have no idea what she's talking about. That's fine too. <laughs> but I wanted to clarify that because some people want to know or talk more about those things. Um, okay, so Pentecost. Let's read about it, and then let's talk about it. All right, I'm going to start on in verse 1 of chapter 2. Actually, I'm going to drink some water, because my mouth is dry, and then I'm going to start. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every tribe or every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, those are people who converted to Judaism, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. Okay. First of all, we see here, I just want to connect us back to last week, we talked about the diaspora, Jews living all over the Roman Empire. This description is Jews talking about where they came from to celebrate at the time of Pentecost. So I just wanted to make that, connect those dots. Um, Pentecost, we talk about it as this event, the time of the Spirit coming and landing on um, these people in tongues of fire, right? Weird, bizarre. Sometimes Bible stories become familiar to us and they stop being weird. I think we should remember that the Bible is very strange and bizarre. Um, it's full of weird things. So anyway, this story is one of them. We talk about it as Pentecost, but Pentecost, they're already there together to celebrate something, right? They're not there anticipating we're going to get together, and the Holy Spirit's going to come. That's not at all in their minds. They're together to observe Pentecost. Well, what is Pentecost? Um, Pentecost is a Greek word. This 
Does anybody like like root words and stuff? What does that make you think of? Anything? Five, yeah. Pentecost equals means 50th. What we know about all these people who are gathered together is that they're Jewish. So the reason they're together is because this is about 50 days after Passover. And then that checks out, right? Jesus died around Passover, right? The Last Supper is Passover night. Um, crucifixion happens. He is resurrected three days later, spends about 40 days checking in, seeing people. He ascends into heaven, so roughly seven days later maybe, we have the disciples gathered together, but we also know from Acts 2 that there's Jews from all over the empire gathered together as well. They've all pilgrimaged to Jerusalem to observe Pentecost. A Greek word that equals or that means or refers to a Jewish festival called Shavuot, which means um, weeks. Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, it's sometimes called, is a Jewish holiday um, <clears throat> observing the giving of the law. So, are we talking about Exodus 19 on Sunday? Uh, no. Okay. In a couple of weeks. Okay. Well, this is a little preview. I thought maybe that it would be the same because I was like, wait a second, this is where we are. Um, <clears throat> Shavuot is a celebration of the giving of the law. Well, think about Exodus, which should be easy since we've been talking about it. When do the Israelites leave Egypt? What do we call that? What do they? What's the meal they have before they leave? Passover, right? That's the same timing as the crucifixion of Jesus. They celebrate the first Passover, they exit Egypt, wander for a while in the wilderness, and then they come to, um, I'm going to draw a mountain, sure, I don't know, Was were there snow caps on Mount Sinai that kind of looks like fire? They come to Mount Sinai about seven weeks later. Um, how many days is seven weeks? How many days? How many days is seven weeks? 49. 49. On the 50th day, God descends onto Mount Sinai in a cloud. Right? Moses, the people gather around the mountain, but they're given very strict perimeters. They have to stay back. God descends in a storm, really, a storm cloud. And the law is given to Moses by God um, on tablets of stone, right? And the people uh, were given this festival to commemorate this event every year, the Feast of Weeks. That's what they're observing in Acts 2. We sh our brains should kind of like, bells should be a little bit ringing when you start to connect these things. God descends in Acts 2, not on a mountain, but on a house. And he comes not in a storm cloud, but in the sound of wind. And instead of leading the people through the wilderness by a cloud of fire, he disperses and descends in tongues of fire on each and every person gathered. Not on a nation, right, but on individuals. These people would have been realizing that this isn't an accident, but God's making connections. What he did for Israel, he's doing in a new and better way for the church. His spirit is not leading them as a nation, but as people. <clears throat> And instead of rebuilding a nation, gathering the dispersed Jews back together to create a country or a nation and take back Jerusalem, he's instead causing them to hear from him in all these diverse languages. Right? They've been taken away from their homes, um, settled in new lands, learned new languages. Instead of returning, they're being 
sent back, sent out in, new, in, a, in their new languages. And the Holy Spirit is coming to them, speaking, them, speaking to them in the languages that they understand. So this is both a bizarre event that actually took place and then also a picture of what this revolution was going to be like. We're not building a nation of people, we're going out into all nations with the power of the Spirit to spread the gospel, this story, this new myth, into new lands, new places. It's a, it's a really sort of symbolic picture of the transition from law to spirit, from burden and performance under this rigid set of sacrificial rules and um, kind of slaving by for our atonement to grace and spirit and power. And it's also subverting the message of the Roman Empire because you might be thinking, I was thinking all week about that verse, um, it's not by might, not by power, but, my, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So this mission is not going to go into all nations like Caesar does and conquer them. It's going to go into all nations with, by the power of the spirit and with this new story to live under. So what does that look like when it happens? The second half of Acts 2 shows us. We have um, Peter preaching, and he remembers his Jewish or uh, Hebrew Bible, and he says, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. This is Peter speaking, but quoting the Old Testament. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Acts 2 says that those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This revolutionary story connects with these people. They're getting it. They're seeing what Jesus has done. And then here's a very familiar um, passage that I think a lot of us, when we hear about the early church, this is what we think of. These converts, these Jewish people who've believed, who've been baptized, who are now followers of Jesus, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers, or the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing these proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It would be really nice if Acts just kind of ended there. <laughs> right? And we could imagine that the gospel goes out and spreads to all nations in sort of this harmonious, idyllic kind of life in the Shire way. Like this reminds me of the end of Lord of the Rings when they're like skipping through the grass. And um, this is Acts 2. So there's 26 or something more chapters. And I don't think we hear anything <laughs> quite like this again. Um, God is still using sinful, flawed image bearers to do his work. Um, in a world that is broken and opposed to the message of the cross. He's restoring image bearers. He's restoring his people to rightly partner with him like they were supposed to way back in Eden. Um, but this work is going to take a lot more than just a revolutionary message because God in his wisdom and in his sovereignty still chooses to use us to do it, right? Um, it takes more than just a revolution to do that. So what we're going to see in the second half of class, we'll take a break in a second, is that it's, it's also, and people hate this, some people hate this word, but the church is also an institution. It needs structure and plans, and it needs order. It needs methods, right? Um, 
Institutions can be bad things because they're run by, by sinful humans, but they also can be steady and sure. They can manage the regular mundane tasks of helping people live into a new story. So, yes, the church is a revolutionary um, way of being in this world. It's living into a revolutionary myth that changes how we think about life, uh, the world, the universe, who we are, all those things. But it also needs an institutional structure to manage the job or the mission that, that Christ gives to the apostles and to, and to us. So um, we'll take a break now. Um, and when we come back, we'll talk about the fun institution stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Today, I thought we'd make another list. I just want you to think about church and what it's like to go to church. And I want us to think about what makes up that experience. So again, if you've grown up in the church, it's kind of like the Bible. We forget how weird and strange it is. If you've grown up in the church, you've probably never stopped to consider how weird it is, right? How bizarre it is, the things that we do when we get together. So let's just kind of try to think about different the different elements of, <laughs> um, of church liturgy, if you want to use that word, or church... Um, the service, how it goes, the, the things we do together. They don't have to be things we do every week, but just what are the things that we do when we get together for church? The body and the blood. Okay. <laughs> we have a snack. <laughs> <laughs> that if you're hungry, leaves you wanting. Um, we have a lot of, we're going to talk about this snack. Uh, that's sort of rude. It's communion. I'm going to cross that off. Um, we have communion, and we, just like Diana said, we do this, we have weird words for it. We call it bod the body and blood of Christ. So we gather together and eat it and drink of it. Okay, what else? Yes. Pray. Pray. Thank you. Yes, we do pray. Somebody said something else that I missed. Yeah, every, yeah. every once in a while. We take dry people <laughs> and make them wet. In white clothes. Sometimes in white clothes, sometimes full grown people, sometimes half grown people, sometimes small babies. Sometimes we fully dunk them. Sometimes we dunk them three times. Sometimes, um, have you ever been to one of those? No. Three times, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Some churches do that. Oh, sometimes, lake. sometimes we enter natural bodies of water. Sometimes we bring hot tub-like pools of water into our buildings <laughs> and pretend that's normal. <laughs> sometimes Jim was baptized in a horse trough. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's a trough. I, I was baptized in a natural body of water. Um, <laughs> weren't you baptized? Oh. I misremembered. I wasn't there for it. I thought it was. We're going to talk about that later. <laughs> um, okay, what else do we do? Yeah. Submit ourselves to teaching and preaching. Yeah, we sit down and we sit under preaching. Even our language uh, to talk about that is weird. If somebody told you that they went to a TED talk and sat under the teaching of somebody at a TED talk, you'd be like, that's weird, dude. You know, like, that's a weird way to talk about listening to somebody. Um, so there's preaching and listening. See? Yeah, uh, that's a weird thing too. We don't sing together in many contexts. Church is, if you go to church, you probably sing with other people way more than everybody, the non-church goers, right? It's a weird habit. What else? Offering. 
Yeah. We pass a plate. Um, and give away our money. What else? Sit and stand and kneel and... Yeah. Exercise. Exercise. <laughs> I could call it exercise. Uh, that might have something to do with a myth that we believe. Any other things? Inscription. Yes. Recite things together. Yeah. Creeds, some some prayers. What was that? We hang out with the same people. Yeah. Okay. That's that you're capturing an important element. We gather together, not arbitrarily, um, not at any place, but a specific place and with specific people. What day do we do it? Well, any day it'll work, you know, any day, or do we have a schedule? Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. Every Sunday. Usually 52 times a year, right? What are we missing? Uh, what? Somebody? We can't, but we really question what we're talking Okay. Come. There's this, this sort of sitting under that submission. That kind of implies something about the person we're listening to. What does it imply? We're trusting in the Lord. Okay, we're trusting the Lord. We trust Him in the Lord. We trust oh. Christ who is in Him. In the preacher? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's an element of authority. or role or office that the person who's preaching the word has. Uh, local church just had their first one of these. It wasn't really part of the weekly church service, but what did we have? Or it wasn't the first one, maybe it was the second one. A vote, yeah, what do we call that? Where did we vote at? Oh, I guess we did it on our phones. Or whatever, but a meeting, yeah, we had a business meeting. Is that what we call it? Congregational. Congregational meeting. Our old church called them business meetings. <laughs> Congregational meeting. Okay, this you is a good, pretty good list. Strangers to do most of this with us. <laughs> <laughs> we bring people. That's true. <laughs> that's true. It's not a closed community, right? It's open to all. It's pretty weird. We're a weird sort, a weird bunch. Membership, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, that's kind of implicit here, membership. Is an element. Can I make a comment? Sure. It's weird from a worldly perspective. Yeah. But, you know, in the family, in the kingdom, it's not weird at all. It's the way we live as citizens of the kingdom. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because that's, that's what I'm hoping for all of us to see, is that all of these things, um, you could say this is what makes up our practices and habits. This is what gives us some things more than other, but gives us some structure as an institution. And all of these things are not man-made. They come to us, um, they're delivered to us by scripture. And we don't often spend time thinking about that, uh, but this is, this is what we're gonna think about for the next few minutes.
Um, these sort of mundane, assumed things that we gather together to do have their roots in the earliest days of the church. All these things, maybe not as we do them exactly, but all of them have their roots in the earliest days of the church. So the same days that we read about in Acts 2, where there's this beautiful, harmonious unfolding of this revolutionary idea and people are just flocking to it. Those same days, those same years, all of this is being put in place to give us the institutional structure needed to sustain the movement. Um, revolutions die out and fizzle on their own. Movements lose uh, energy and steam. You need structures to uphold them. And you need a structure, we're going to see, to house the myth or the story of the gospel that is the foundation for all of it. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. Um, the Bible gives us regulations about how this church, born at Pentecost, is to conduct itself. I really struggled with how to organize this section um, because we're kind of cherry-picking from the book of Acts, from the epistles, um, the letters of the apostles, topics or ideas that are we're sort of implicitly um, seeing in the early church. Things and practices and habits that they begin um, to shape our own communities. So I struggled with how to organize this. I don't know if this is the best way. This is how we're going to do it. It's kind of a topical look. We'll, we'll look through one thing at a time. So these are the three categories. Word and sacrament. Order and freedom, order and freedom, gathering and being. And each of these categories are answering a different question. With word and sacrament, we're asking how do we make disciples? <clears throat> the answer is by word and by sacrament. Who has authority? We kind of have touched on this already. The order um, and then some freedom is is given to us to determine that question, to answer that question. What do we do together? We gather and we live together, we exist together in specific ways. Um, so that's kind of how the institution of the church comes to be. So first of all, word and sacrament. We're gonna jump um, I think this is a typo. This shouldn't be 12, this should be 16, sorry. I'm not sure how that happened. Or no, not 12. 26. Yeah, sorry, I have it wrong on my paper and on the screen. I know it's Matthew 26 in my brain. <laughs> um, okay, so he took a cup, who? Who took this cup? Jesus, okay? This is the, um, the Last Supper. Jesus, before he goes, institutes two ordinances. An ordinance is just like an order or a decree. It's a fancy word for um, kind of a rule that he makes. Um, sometimes these ordinances are called sacraments. That's the word I'm using here. Sacrament is on, I believe it's on your vocab list. Um, all it is, is Augustine paraphrases it this way, a sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible grace. It's a picture that communicates an idea. Jesus gives two ordinances or two sacraments before he leaves earth. The first one he gives at the Passover, um, meal with his disciples, the Last Supper. I could get into like, like I did for Pentecost and um, the Feast of Weeks. We could do that with Passover and that would be kind of fun, but we don't have time. But in that moment, Jesus points to his own fulfillment of Old Testament promises and at the very Jewish festival that he's fulfilling at the Passover feast where that, you know, we talked about this last week, the blood of the lamb is spilled for the redemption of the people, right? They're commemorating that event at the Passover and Jesus takes that opportunity to institute a new feast, a new sign or um, picture of the covenant. 
So he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is to become a habit for Jesus' followers to eat of the cup and drink of the wine when they gather together. So we have one sacrament instituted by Christ. Um, sometimes it's called the Eucharist. Maybe some of you have attended churches where it's called that. That's kind of a big fancy word that maybe some of you don't. You know, depending on your history, you might not like that word. All that word means, it's a Greek word, Eucharist. Eucharisteo. All it means is to give thanks. So when it says, when he had given thanks, that's Eucharisteo. So we call it the Eucharist. Um, what's interesting about this is the Passover meal had all these rules, right? The blood of the lamb needed to be drained. It needed to be totally roasted. It, it had to have be bitter herbs and unleavened bread and you had to eat it with your shoes on like all these stipulations about the feast and if, with communion Jesus comes along and says take these two familiar elements bread that you eat daily wine that you use for celebration and drink them and eat them and remember me right um, this is a picture of his story, picture of the gospel, put on display, and he tells the disciples, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. This is to be a part of what you do when you gather together. And we see that happening all through the book of Acts. Um, the, the apostles make reference to it in the epistles. And we do it what month, once a month. Some churches do it every week. Some churches less often. But it has been a part of the church since. The second ordinance that Jesus establishes before he leaves, he models it early in his life, but then establishes it as something that the disciples are to do. We've already read this tonight. Um, but he tells them to go out and make disciples, right? That's the, the mission he gives them. Notice that he doesn't say, go out and build the church. Because who's building the church? Yes. Who promised to do it? Jesus, I will build my church. You're gonna go make disciples of all nations. How? I'm glad you asked. You're going to baptize them. We talked about this already. We're going to take dry people and make them wet, and that's going to help us form disciples, make disciples. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we have two ordinances, communion and baptism. Um, this also points back to the Old Testament. We keep, we're not going to get into that, but it does. And in addition to these two sacraments, this idea of teaching. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. So right from the get-go, before we ever have a church service, before the Spirit comes, we have Jesus telling his disciples what they're supposed to do, in a very minimal sense, to make disciples to make more disciples, right? They're to observe these two pictures, and they're to speak of or preach the word. What I want us to see um, is that both of these things are about the story that Jesus has just lived out in his earthly ministry. Both of the sacraments show us the gospel. They take, baptism shows us cleansing, right? Burial and resurrection. That's how the New Testament talks about it. It puts on display the story of the gospel. Communion is about the blood of Jesus being spilled, the body of Christ being broken for us, right? That story that Jesus lived out, that the, um, we read all those summaries of it that Paul gives, that myth that Jesus lives to reject the myth of the Roman world is put on display through the sacraments. And then we're to 
specifically tell the story, preach the word. So all of this is about the gospel story shaping and forming people. The same book that we read about the tongues of fire descending on the heads of Christians has four mentions of Christians gathering and breaking bread, which is shorthand for having that feast, that covenant feast. There's 23 mentions of people and groups of people being baptized. And there are 75 mentions of the ministry of the word or preaching. So right from the get-go, the disciples are doing what Jesus told them to do. How do we make disciples? We tell them this story over and over and over and over. We preach and teach the story in new ways over and over so that they understand it better, understand the implications of it better. I'm still learning. You know, I've been in the, Christ in the church my whole life. I went to school and studied these things. I still regularly learn new details about Jesus' life and ministry, about New Testament things connecting to Old Testament things. Like, the story does not, we don't exhaust it. God is a master storyteller. We spend our whole lives learning more and more about it. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. That's what makes a disciple. We show and see and taste and feel with our hands and, and, and feeling the water. It's a material experience. Um, over and over again in these sacraments, the gospel story. It won't usually be mass conversions like we read about in Acts. Sometimes God can do that whenever he wants. But usually, the sort of regular experience of the church is the ordinary mundane, habitual formation of disciples slowly over time. And both of those things, the kind of boring version that we don't find, get as excited about, the mundane realities of all of this, and those moments of signs and wonders and miracles, both of those things are powered by the Spirit. All right, so how do we make disciples? Word and sacrament. Who has authority? This is a trickier question to answer. Um, and the reason it's tricky is actually because I think, from my understanding, I think there is both order and freedom. We talked last week about how the um, gospel and the church can go into new places and sort of be portable. It can take on different shapes and forms depending on the cultures that it's going into. I think the Bible allows for that. So we don't get in our New Testaments this like clear flow, sh flow chart of authority and how it's supposed to function in a church. We get some ideas and then we do the best we can. We exercise wisdom and we um, organize ourselves the way that that makes sense. Some people would probably really struggle with me being okay with that freedom, so there's disagreement about that, but um, let's look at the, root, the roots and you can consider those things on your own. Um, all right, so we're going to go, to understand this order, we're going to go back to Matthew 16. 18 and 19. These, this is the right reference. That's actually where it is. Um, <laughs> this is Jesus. We read this last week, so it should be familiar. This is Jesus talking to the disciples, and he says um, to Peter, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right, much ink has been spilled about these verses. Much fighting <laughs> has happened in the church because of them and, the, and different interpretations of them. What I want us to see, big picture, is that Jesus is taking the authority that he has by his nature as the Son of God and in some way giving that authority to the apostles. So we talked earlier about how God uses people to do his work. That's what's happening here. And in some sense, Jesus is allowing Peter specifically, but the apostles to have the authority of the church. 
we don't like this as Americans. We'd rather nobody have any sort of authority that they could potentially use to impact me and my personal freedom, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of recoil at that word. We don't like it, but people in different cultures and at different times had no issue with that. So that's something we need to kind of think about. The apostles, which that literally just means um, sent ones. That's on your vocab list too. Jesus sends out the apostles in the Great Commission. The disciples become apostles by nature of their being sent. And in that sending, Jesus gives them authority. So we have, even before Jesus is gone, this idea of authority transferring from Jesus to the apostles. Peter and the other disciples, um, based on their behavior in the book of Acts, seem to understand this. They seem to have this sense that God has given us work to do, and we have the authority to do it. Um, the authority is going to be very important moving forward for us studying church history. The question of authority has shaped so much about how the church has unfolded over the centuries. Who's in charge um, is a big mess that we have to figure out as people. And we haven't done historically a great job of that. We'll see that going forward. But there's two clear things um, that unfold in the New Testament. First, there are things called offices. That is, jobs in the church that need to be filled by individuals. We see this separation between those, or a distinction really, between those in the congregation, the people who fill the church, and those who have the authority to oversee the church. We mention that here, right? You knew that. We, we go and we listen. We sit under the preaching of the word. And somebody with Authority, somebody who's authorized, right, those are the same root words, to do it preaches the word to us. And we listen to it. So we act this out every week. Not all of us, probably very few of us, have any desire to be a pastor. And I think most of us think that that's a good thing, that we don't have to be, right? Somebody... Um, multiple people in churches are qualified to fill that role. Um, there's a few different words the New Testament uses for this. Um, they're on your vocab sheet. I was going to walk through them, but I, I feel like I'm going to have too much, so I think I'm going to skip that. But those Greek words, I'll just mention them. There are episkopos, which means bishop, and pres. Buritas or something like that. Pres we get the, our word Presbyterian, um, which means elder. The Bible uses those terms interchangeably, the New Testament. So there's these roles that emerge in the New Testament, um, and they are offices, official positions of authority in the church. But we're not just, thank God, given these offices that need to be filled. We're given qualifications for the people who are to fill them. I don't think I put it on the notes, but these are in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 3. Um, the New Testament is less concerned with gifting and talent and more concerned with character and the fruit of the Spirit. Our concern with those things isn't always as faithful as Scripture is. People like gifts. People like talented people. We like our leaders to be a little bit more like Caesar and a little bit less like Jesus. Um, but the Bible gives us these qualifications to push back on that impulse so that we can choose good leaders. The other thing that emerges is this idea of plurality. More than one. Uh, every church should have a plurality of leaders. Um, because the Bible does not, like I said earlier, present us with a clear organization for how the church is to function, there's this freedom that we have to organize ourselves. Um, some people swear by specific forms of church government. Some people insist on congregationalism or Episcopalianism or Presbyterianism. Those words you should see in those Greek words. And they, these are different ways that the church has organized itself throughout history. They're all 
flawed. None of them is perfect. What's important is that we observe and submit ourselves to scripture and the, the structure that the Bible gives us, and we do something to put checks and balances in place to um, properly use the authority given to the church by Jesus. There's a question that's going to come up next week about why we do something, so I want to mention it today. What if there's a disagreement? What if a, bis or a bishop or a pastor of this church and a pastor of this church, they both have authority, they're both called to those roles. What if they disagree? What do we do? Well, Acts gives us a precedent. In chapter 15, we are given the first church council. Um, you can read about this. It's an interesting story. We don't often give it a lot of attention because we're not tempted to make people convert to Judaism before they convert to Christianity. But in the first century, they were. And they thought, well, they can't just jump right into Christianity. They need to be circumcised. They need to become a Jewish person before they can become a Christian person. That's what some people said. And Peter was tempted to agree with them. And Paul, who's called to preach to the Gentiles, says no. There is neither Jew nor Greek or slave or free, right? So they have a real dispute. Peter and Paul, the big dogs. How do they handle it? They gather the elders and the, and the pastors, those with authority, they gather together in Jerusalem and they have a meeting and they settle it and they call it a council. That's gonna, just kind of put that in your pocket, that idea, that precedent is gonna matter a lot next week when we talk about the patristic era. Get excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more thing. Um, we gather and exist together in a church and the things that we do together are going to kind of fill in the rest of this list that we made. We've already talked about communion. Um, we've talked about baptism. We talked about the preaching and the listening and the submitting and the authority. We talked about congregations and the idea of polity and business. The rest of this the liturgy of gathering together, being together, doing things together, is kind of between the lines throughout the epistles and the book of Acts. But this idea of gathering is really in um, the definition of what the church is. This word, ecclesia, is the Greek word that Jesus um, uses when he says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my ecclesia. All it means is an assembly of people gathered together. So right in the name of it, in the name church, some of you might know Spanish. Iglesia is the Spanish word for church. That helps me. Um, comes from the same root word. All a church is an assembly, is an assembly of people. And the idea is that the church is to assemble. We're to be together. And that's a weird thing. We don't, in this room, I know this isn't church uh, specifically, but we don't have a lot of reason to know one another, except that we all believe this story and live under this myth of how we understand the world. That's really the only reason we gather together, and it's the only reason we do it every week, right? We're sharing this story, preaching this story to one another, reminding each other of this story. And the uh, writer of Hebrews talks about this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The apostles know we need the habit of getting together. It's to encourage each other. It's to spur one another on. And it's to, like I said, tell the story to one another. So that's why we gather in community. So we've talked about this. We also, weirdly, sing together. 
This is also from the New Testament. We didn't make this up. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach. We've talked about that. And admonish or encourage one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. Singing, teaching, speaking words to one another. Oh wait, that was prayers, not singing. Um, all of this comes right out of our, the pages of our New Testament. It's to, to be an ordinary, normal thing that we do together. Here's some other random things. Why do we gather on the Lord's Day? You guys can um, jot these down and look them up later. We're not going to read about everything. We gather on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday. It's the first day. Why? Why that day? Yeah, the resurrection. The story, there it is again. The story of Jesus, that counter myth, um, that sub subversive, subser subversive message that rejects the story that the world tells us, uh, comes to um, its peak that Sunday morning of Jesus' resurrection. In Acts, they talk about gathering together on the Lord's Day to break bread. In Revelation, John's alone on the island of Patmos in um, exile or whatever, and he refers to uh, being in the scriptures on the Lord's Day. He uses that language. So there's even a reason why we gather on Sundays. We give of our money. Um, this obviously has some sort of root in the tithes of the Old Testament, but that changes into something new when we see, like we saw in Acts 2, the church caring for one another, supporting one another financially, sharing what they have, giving to others. That's a tangible way that we believe the story. It's not the earth's way of power and money and wealth and riches, we give our money away to remind us that it's not where our trust is to be. Um, it's not our source of strength and safety and security. We give it away to, to tangibly tell ourselves that story again. And then we read the scriptures together. This is, was a uh, Jewish tradition and it becomes a Christian one also where people of the book the story is in these pages, and we're to gather together and tell one another the stories through the words that have been given to us. Is there anything we didn't talk about? Prayer um, was in Acts 2. They devoted themselves to prayer. How about this? Posture changes isn't specifically um, prescribed for the church, but all over our Bibles. Kneel before the Lord, stand before the Lord, lie prostrate before the Lord. We're embodied creatures. We have bodies that remind us um, of our limits, of our creatureliness, of the fact that there's a creator, just like Job, right? We act out that submission and receptive posture before God with our bodies. And inviting others, um, that's part of the sentness, the apostleship given, to go out and bring them in to hear the story. I think that's everything. Um, are there any questions or things that I confused you about or things that we do at church that don't make sense to you even after <laughs> kind of talking through this? Any comments? It's easy to get excited about the first half of what I talked about I think tonight. The, the spirit coming forth, the um, sort of miraculous nature of tongues and miracles, mass conversions, right? Like that's, we want to be part of a movement. That's a natural, humans love crowds, right? 
we go to sporting events just to feel alive, right? Like, we love the energy and the enthusiasm. We want to be a part of something. And sometimes that's what we experience at church. And that's good, and it's real. And God can, is free, of course, to move in those ways. But none of us has the energy or the perseverance to live like that all the time. And God knows we're weak and frail, and we need to be sustained by one another. And all of these things, even though they're normal to us and maybe uninteresting, um, all of these things sustain us in that long, steady, boring ob obedience of discipleship. Um, Jesus spent three years of his life in sort of exciting, action-packed ministry. But he spent 30 years of his life doing things that were so uninteresting they're not even written down, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so we're going to have a similar experience. So um, I wanted to have all of this in place so that as we move out of the New Testament next week, we're, we have categories for things. So, thanks for bearing with more groundwork and foundational stuff.